Hi, Steve. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm having a great day. Good. Um, you know, this is your first time on Blogging Heads. Welcome. I know. I'm way, way overdue. I just want to make it clear that you've made made me feel comfortable coming along anytime I want it. It's just taken me a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we've been recruiting. It was an intensive recruiting effort, I would say. We've enlisted some of Washington's major players in an effort to get you here, and, and here you are finally. I'm seducible. Speaking of major players, uh, one way I would introduce you to our audience is you write the blog, The Washington Note, and it seems to me uh, kind of part of your value added in the ecosystem of foreign policy blogs is that you try to give people a sense for what's going on kind of behind the scenes, the kind of Washington backstory to the foreign policy, and I think exactly. you're somebody who kind of prides yourself on uh, kind of rubbing elbows with the... Uh, with the major players in Washington, name correct dropping, me. You know, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, doing all the name dropping and stuff. See, the problem is <laughs> I wasn't going to put it like that. Steve. In Spago, in uh, West Hollywood, and Spago was the power place in, in in town. Somebody told me the most powerful guy in Los Angeles was the Maitre D at Spago, and I've always wanted to be that in Washington. Well, all they need to do is open a Spago, and they'll know who to go to. I think. But you are you are the blogger's equivalent of that. That's a, that would be a good motto for your blog, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know the whole idea behind behind the Washington Note is to provide some analysis that I think sometimes doesn't run in many of the mainstream outlets. But uh, you know, none of us have a monopoly on truth, so it's you know my own view. It's an op-ed a day. I mean, it's like what you do. You you provide commentary, but you know, all all, all of a sudden you're in the New York Times every other day. So. Uh, That's about to end. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I think that that it's also something where so many Americans are intrigued, or were intrigued by the by the TV show West Wing, or some of the insider political shows. And there is insider political stuff that goes on in in this town. And some of, some of us are, I don't know if you'd call it privileged to have it, but you know, we get we get access to these to these things. And I think that. Um, it's useful for me to go in there and kind of give people some idea what's going on. And we saw when neoconservatives became so powerful in the foreign policy realm, part of it it was because they dominated those little cocktail parties and those those dinner parties in uh, uh, in and around Vice President Cheney's house and, and others. And I think it's important for there to be some kind of transparency, um, as minimal as it is hmm. in, in what's going on. And so I kind of feel like it's not just name-dropping. I'm trying to give people an idea of what's going on in, 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 in the way D.C. works. And if in order to fulfill that mission you have to drop the occasional name, so be it. It's a sacrifice you're willing to make, right? Exactly. Well, Glad that's the kind can. of guy you are. Speaking of neoconservatives, um, you know, I read a, a characterization of your ideology that I might be inclined to take issue with, and, and <laughs> it's, I think it was actually in Wikipedia. Okay. Where it, it called you left-leaning. Now, when oh. I, I've been asked actually to characterize your ideology a couple of times, and and what I've always found myself choosing between, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, you may well quibble with this, but is choosing between a centrist realist and a slightly right of center realist. And of course, realist to those who don't study these things means somebody who kind of, you know, maintains fixed on the national interest in a steely eyed fashion, doesn't get distracted by woolly-minded idealism, you know, very right. pragmatic, and so on. Um, do, do you, do you, what, what do you, what do you say about your ideology? I think it's pretty much like progressive realism. Who, who <laughs> came up with that idea? Uh, I, no, I, I, I think that, look, I think that Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the editor of The Nation, uh, came up to me at a party once, name-dropping, and I was, I'm name-dropping, but Katrina came up and said, Steve, realism has become the new liberal ideology. And on one level, she was joking. On one level, she's quite serious that in this climate in which the President of the United States and the people that were animating a lot of what he was doing in foreign policy weren't thinking about the costs and consequences of their actions. And this was having a devastating impact on our, on our future ability to impact global events down the road. And it's not to say that America can't be connected to great purposes or, you know, try to deal with serious problems of genocide, Darfur, um, global poverty, AIDS, etc. Uh, it's the question that there are certain priorities out there and, and we don't have unlimited resources and attention. So I think to some degree, realism 
is not just an end. It's, it's, a, it's a, to some degree, a methodology to get us back to thinking about how we can marshal our resources to handle great purposes. And I think that comes pretty close to actually where you are, not that you know, we want to design this to agree. But those who see me as left-leaning leaning probably make a mistake. I think a lot of left-leaning people find themselves attracted to some of my ideas because they are rational <laughs> in a time of a lot of irrationality in foreign policy. Um, but I tend not, I, I, I try to remind people, particularly in the blog and particularly when I say nice things about Chuck Hagel, I think that Chuck Hagel's um, template for thinking about national security and foreign policy areas is the winning template, whether that's taken by the next Democratic contender or the next Republican contender. I think that, that Hagel specifies things when, you know, without looking at ideology in ways I think are very, very sensible and important and begin to lay down a groundwork for a much better future. Than, than we have now. Yeah, so I do. I do want to get into Hegel in a guy. bit because I think you, you more than I, and more than a lot of people think he actually has a realistic, has some kind of shot of, of getting into the White House. I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical. Mm. I want to, I want to talk a, about it's him. A big call. First, it's a first, big gamble. What, what's that? I, I, it's not, I used to think that. I think that as time goes on, the only chance for Chuck Hegel to really come in is to see the uh, annihilation and decimation often self-inflicted in the other Republican campaigns. And at the end of the day, they look and they see they've just still got no one good. He then may run that. And I think that's, I think that's his strategy if he runs. But I don't think he's committed to running no matter what. If somebody's still strong and has a juggernaut operation, um, I don't think Senator Hagel will run. Okay. Uh, so may maybe I, I had overestimated your your uh, your, your, your uh... No, I just changed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> under, my, under my probing uh, questioning. Um, but I wanted to, you know, on this ideology issue, I think one thing that has happened is that uh, people, anyone who is kind of uh, really energetically opposed to neocons or to Bush's foreign policy, which aren't always the same thing, but if no. you're really fervently opposed to either, people cast you as being in the left, when in fact there are a lot of principled traditional conservatives who are at least as outraged as anybody because this this is not uh, this is not what what uh, you know kind of mainstream conservative foreign policy has been and when, when I say that I think of you as centrist or right of center I, I'm thinking of two things first of all uh, you know you were at some point before I guess coming to uh, New America you were at the Nixon Center which I would certainly characterize as right of center realism the center. and the and the other director. thing is I think of you as having a lot of respect for Brent Scowcroft as, as yeah. actually I do too. And that is kind of Bush one, right? That's right. And and, and it, he's and I would call him, you know, a somewhat right of center realist. Although, you know, it's reasonable enough that I could totally live without being, even though it's a little right of me, I could totally live without being the guiding force behind American foreign policy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that 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 you're, you say it right. I think Brent Scowcroft, um, you know, Speak Brzezinski is a left of center realist. Uh, and, and Brzezinski and Scowcroft, when it comes to national security issues and how they basically look at the international system, are hardly distinguishable from each other. But Arne Cantor, who used to work in the Bush administration, Mitchell Reese, who worked in this Bush administration, Richard Haas, who worked in this Bush administration, or Flint Leverett, uh, who was in the National Security Council staff, clearly a Republican uh, realist now, works with me here at, at New America. Dimitri Symes, the current president of the Nixon Center, who was kind of like the latter-day Kissinger to Richard Nixon before he died. All of these people generally agree with the critique that, that, that you and people like me have provided to, uh, uh, you know, offered on George Bush's foreign policy and direction. And I think there's something to be said when you can get so many Republicans lined up and, and be, as we put them in the Coalition for Realistic Foreign Policy, with pe libertarians, liberal internationalists. We have people like Charles Kupchin, um, very well-known academic liberal internationalist, and Chalmers Johnson with his book Nemesis and Blowback. Cheryl Schweninger, I think a liberal uh, progressive, in the, the, the same organization as some of these, these realist critics of, of, of Bush. And so I think we've entered a time where there's so much outrage and frustration with an alliance between neoconservatives and pugnacious nationalists. Um, and when I mean pugnacious, I mean sort of, you know, people that still carry the flame of Jesse Helms in foreign policy. This is what you have this alliance against, and this is what has really been animating 
uh, a lot of my work and, and my goals. Well, you know, it's funny that the first two examples you used there for right of center and left of center were Scowcroft and Brzezinski because the – uh, my, you know, the next to last of my New York Times columns, I've got this one-month run of, of, of being allowed to write columns there. And the one that, that I did this neo, yeah, neo combat so cool. column, <laughs> and the there was this paragraph toward the end where I said, uh, left, many left of center and right of center thinkers agree that. And then I put the, this this two bullet point you know strategy that I personally subscribe to. And I almost inserted in there, after left of center and right of center, Brzezinski and Scowcroft as examples. But then I thought, no, I, I guess I've never heard them say it exactly like this, although I'm 99% sure they'd buy into it. But, they do. But, but that, is exactly, that is exactly the point, is that there really is, partly in opposition to the pretty extreme foreign policy we've seen, there is a kind of convergence and alliance going on among people who in an earlier age would have seen themselves maybe as ideological adversaries, and now they realize that this is no time to kind of cut the salami that fine, I, I guess. Yeah, I kind of think that, you know, once the neoconservatives are out or after the Bush administration is out, I think a lot of the uh, warm and cuddly feelings among some people in this crowd will deteriorate because it's going to be harder. You know, when you're out, you know, it's, you know we're, we, I was reading Barack Obama's speech the other day. Barack Obama's speech is a nice first step into foreign policy, but there are a lot of weak points in it. One of the weak points, as I see it, is it doesn't make hard choices. It really doesn't lay out priorities. While he talks about, um, you know, getting the military in good condition, he doesn't really define, which I think is very important for any Democratic presidential candidate, when and what kind of wars is he going to deploy the military toward, and which ones will he not? And I, I think that's missing. But I also think that he advocates an increase in in uh, uh, military capacity without really fundamentally asking the question of why our system is so broken uh, and what, our, what the consequences of that are. Why are we as a nation spending more on defense today than all other nations in the world combined, and yet we feel like our security deliverables are declining, we don't feel safe, and what will just throwing more men, more women, and more money at that problem really solve? And, um, you know, Barack Obama kind of falls into that trap. So he is definitely not in my mind, with us on, on some of the more realistic assessment of, of tough choices that have to be made. And, and that's an example that once we begin to move on alternative political choices that we have beyond Bush and Cheney, beyond John Bolton, beyond uh, uh, Condi Rice, etc., will be a question of, okay, how do we compare the political choices we have and, and do they um, move us forward, or are we really getting a kind of left version of neoconservatism, or a soft version of values-driven and 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 uh, uh, you know calculations on how we should deploy force and try to try and achieve things that really doesn't look at some of the costs and consequences? Yeah, so so we can get we can see a real fragmentation among some of the people that are allied right now. Uh, yeah, I agree. I was going to ask you what your reservations were about the Obama speech because I know in your blog you alluded to having some. Yeah. Um, I don't want to hit him on the head too hard. You know, I want him out there talking more about it. It's a big, sprawling, kitchen sink speech. Uh, it's got a lot in it, but I, but I think, nonetheless, it demonstrates the an, a beginning to try and think things through rigorously, and I think that should be applauded. But my biggest critique today is it's outrageous that the American taxpayer is paying for more money on security uh, and defense, and we've militarized our foreign policy. Uh, and we're not, we're not, we don't feel like a safe nation. And I don't think he provides an alternative for that or really addresses the question beyond saying we need more troops. I'll tell you one aside, it's kind of interesting. I just got back from Havana, Cuba recently with uh, Larry Wilkerson, former um, chief of staff at the State Department, and who a long time aide to, to Colin Powell. So he's one of these dissident Republicans who's done a lot to open up these debates. You know, Cuba had no diplomatic relations with Pakistan in October of 2005 when, when Cuba had, or Pakistan had a devastating earthquake along the Kashmir border. And this is among the more fundamentalist Muslim areas of the region and very, very remote and hard to get to. And we sent, uh, the United States sent a good number of doctors, as did Europe. Our base camps were there for about a month. Uh, we had one each. Cuba sent 2,500 doctors, and they were there for seven months. Uh, and it, it was very Peace Corps-ish in sort of a massive way. And I understand there are problems in Cuba, but it really does harken back to this kind of Kennedy-esque and Sergeant Shriver time of, of, of the Peace Corps and of doing important things in the world. And I tell you, 
Cuba, which used to rev you know export revolution, export militaries, export uh, munitions and whatnot, is now exporting doctors. And this is a controversial subject, but it ought to be something we ought to reflect on in terms of our own public diplomacy and how we look at our profile in the world. When I look at our military budgets and I say, there's something really wrong here. So but Obama's idea of pouring more resources into a broken military machine doesn't thrill me. But, but Obama's speech does seem to me very Peace Corps-ish, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a warm and fuzzy speech that yeah. doesn't make hard choices. There's a lot. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, there's this interesting sentence. In today's globalized world, the security of the American people is inextricably linked to the security of all people. Well, even I wouldn't have put it quite that strongly. I would have said that there's a higher correlation between our welfare and the welfare of more people abroad probably than ever. Right. But, but that seems to me in some ways the conceptual backbone of the speech, because he does go on to talk about a lot of what you might call kind of international social service. Uh, and I, my assumption is that that's the way a lot of those troops would be used. Uh, and it yeah. sounds like you're, you, are, you, are, you are buying into the kind of, you know, uh, idea of, you know, it's related to kind of Joseph Nye's idea of soft power, that, that, uh, that there are a lot of ways to exert influence in the world. One of them is to build up goodwill by, uh, you know, by doing good, right? I mean, you agree that that's, that's more important than it was uh, uh, 75 years ago or something, right? I think it's hugely more important, and I don't think that we, one should forsake military power, but we need to look at today that the reality is, at this po point, given our crappy relations with a lot of the world, classic hard power, military power, bombs, bullets, and guns, are soft. They're not yielding results that we want. Uh, and I think we need to try another strategy where what Joe and I call soft power actually is a lot harder uh, in many ways in achieving the objectives and results we have, and we've got to get that blend right. And Wait, that what, what do you mean when you say... We need to move. I think that's the core tenet and a good framing way for progressive realism to go. You, you mean that soft power is a more challenging thing to... I think soft power today is hard. It's hard, but you're advocating it and, and, and saying it, it's, it's challenging, but, but the way to go, or a way to go. Is that right? Well, I mean, I think it's challenging. I mean, it's what I mean by saying it's hard, not difficult to do. I mean, it's hard in the sense that it achieves more tangible results yeah. than does the deployment of, uh, you know, a, a Kansas uh, brigade yeah, uh, I think, to, uh, to achieve results. I think and the Obama speech was, you know, part of it was reacting in classic fashion to the standard critique of Democrats. You're not tough enough. So he says, okay, we'll, we'll have a zillion more troops with me. And then, uh, and that's supposed to help there. But if you if you look at what the rest of the speech suggests about the way they would be deployed, you do get the idea that there would be, you know, a certain amount of kind of helping people out or or nation yeah, building. I, like that. I mean, it, it you know, I'm sure that Samantha Power had a lot to do with this talk, or the speech. I'm not positive of that, but she was his advisor. It's a, it's an inspired, enlightening speech in many ways. Um, I largely agree with the impulse of it. I think, though, that Democrats have to get beyond this chip on the shoulder that they fear that they are going to be critiqued about not being able to be good on national security, so they think they need to be for bigger Pentagon budgets. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that that's a problem. I think they need to talk about a national security for the 21st century that, that lays out the contingencies we face as a nation and as a world. And he gets into a lot of them, but they're not organized very well, not as well as I would like. And then I think you then say, how are we organized to, to, to meet these, these challenges and resources? And I think, therefore, that then exposes a lot of the anachronisms and a lot of the idiocy of the way in which we spend money today, deploy forces and troops, and the way we try to achieve our, our, our results. You know, he's got one clause in there I wrote about in the blog a little bit while ago that I largely support, which is, you know, increasing poverty assistance and, you know, deal, dealing with, I mean, on one level I agree with it. I like, you know, the fact that America's doing more in aid. Um, I see China out there basically doing a lot in aid, too, but in a very mercantilist way. And, and sometimes I think China's moving the ball forward more than the United States is in places like Latin America, South Asia, and Africa. Um, you mean it's advancing its own interests more than we are advancing ours? It's advancing its own interests as well as the interests of its clients. It's advancing interests by doing what we did in the 1950s, by building infrastructure, dams, power systems, telecommunication systems, tying its networks into those in what I largely consider to be a win-win um, 
situation. Japan did the same thing. It was its development strategy in Southeast Asia in launching the sort of, you know, the tigers in, in Southeast Asia. Japan was a primary driver of that infrastructure. We approach the, these parts of the world now with poverty relief and poverty assistance. And while I applaud the impulse, I really, really do. I don't want to denigrate that part of Obama's speech. I did knock him a little bit for not having the numbers right because he said he wanted to double what we do in the world to $50 billion. At, at best, we do 22 and a half, and the, and the real number is 16.7. And I said, let's not give ourselves too much credit for where we are today, uh, because we simply don't do enough today. And to double that, of course, it would be a gain, but nowhere near $50 billion. Um, I think China is the ascending power that matters in, in, in many parts of the developing world today, and it's uh, something that we could – we, we could get back, and, and rather than doing this from, um, I don't know, faith-based global development, you know, poverty concern, I think that there are real benefits to getting in with and working as the Chinese are doing with Africa and, and getting the place operating in a profitable way, building a global middle class, getting other kinds of things. But when you're always allowing poverty concerns or, or relief concerns to be what drives why you're in Africa or why you're in certain parts of Latin America, I think it undermines the long-term effectiveness of our program and our message as a nation. Okay, but the, the standard rap on China, and here, and here let me back up and say uh, we're getting, uh, you brought up Samantha Power, who, who, is, who is, I don't know, I guess informally, not formally, but is one of, one of Barack Obama's uh, key foreign policy yeah, advisors, she for him we for think. A year. I, I, I have a suspicion that the realist in you worries about her exerting too much influence over Barack Obama. And let me, let me go ahead and flesh out the China thing, and, and, right. and I think you already know where I'm going. But the standard rap on China and the way they do things is, first of all, yes, they, they do spend money helping a lot of uh, what you call their clients. But first of all, they do so with more or less total disregard for the kind of moral nature of the clients. In other words, they're not losing sleep overnight over whether uh, they are helping out uh, governments that are tyrannical or governments that are democratic. To them, a client is a client. Secondly, to the extent that their focus is on winning over the clients uh, as opposed to alleviating uh, things like poverty, then, 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 then the people are trying to help our elites in a certain sense, in those states, right? They, they want the most influential people in those states to warm up to them. Now, now both of those priorities lead, you know, influence as exerted by China to differ from the kind of thing that I think Samantha Power would tend to be interested in, although I've got to admit I'm totally operating on stereotype here, but she is certainly thought of as someone who is concerned with human rights and who would certainly applaud this emphasis on poverty alleviation. And it seems to me that when you, when you, when you start uh, kind of lauding China's approach, they're the, they're the real realist in you is coming out. And, right. and, 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 and you're looking at a choice that fundamentally a president ultimately has to make to some extent. Uh, and, every one of uh, Go ahead. No, I think every one of the presidents make that choice. I think every one of the presidents... I think if you look at every presidential administration, including this one, they all start out with a human rights agenda, human rights concerns with China, largely the kind of impulses and concerns that Samantha, whom I admire and respect a great deal, would um, craft for Republican or Democratic presidents. And every single president of the United States ultimately yields to a more self-interest driven, national self-interest driven uh, bet that engagement with China, that economic development, that the integration uh, cannot ultimately be unplugged to satisfy these other issues. So, and I think that the China relationship, which used to be much thinner, there used to be much less, um, many fewer cords tying it together. So you'd have a, you know, the Jackson Bannock Amendment every year would cost, you know, force it to go back and look and put, you know, whether whether China's human rights record was worth uh, keeping our trade relations going and put all of our eggs in one basket. I think the China-U.S. relationship has become much more diversified, just like the U.S.-Soviet relationship became much more diversified uh, and was largely stabilizing. So if an area blows up in one part of the relationship, you can carry it on in another. I think China is doing in Africa, in South Asia, and a lot of other um, distressed parts of the world is doing exactly what we did with China. It's engaging elites for its own interests, and we 
set the model. Almost no one says this, but it's doing what American policy did with China, and it is achieving friends in the world by doing that. I think that Chie Nakane, a famous anthropologist, once said about Japan uh, when it was engaged in its activities that it's neither a moral nor an immoral country. It's an amoral country. And I think that China, in many ways, is an amoral country driven to preserve itself, secure itself, build markets, build its legitimacy, um, and, and is engaged in doing this. And its mercantilist, self-interested efforts often yield benefits. Perhaps that was not where they started out to cause those benefits for many others in societies beyond, beyond the elites that they, that, they, that they may be dealing with. Yeah. I, I think that the United States has positioned itself through, and, and will always struggle with this, it's been a, an all, a, a long-term struggle. The folks like Samantha Power and others want, I believe, and maybe I'm stereotyping here, to see America essentially as a moral nation achieving great moral ends. And I, and I do think that's important. But I don't think moral ends at any cost make sense. No, but I do think, I mean, first of all, you, you describe China as amoral. That's the way realism as a foreign policy school has been described. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I, I'm making realism. a connection between the, the two. But I would say that I yeah. do think something has changed that moves the kind of enlightened realist somewhat in the direction of the agenda of a Samantha Power, as I understand it, based totally on stereotype, which is to say, yeah. in a world in which terrorism is a real danger, and, and, you, and there are actually lots of nations in which you can imagine, uh, you know, grassroots resentment or, or anti-Americanism fomenting terrorism and, and, and serving terrorist rec recruiters, in that kind of world, if you take terrorism to be the real threat to American interest that I think it is, then even the realist is worried about the situation for a lot of really non-elite people in these countries, uh, you, know, you know, and, that, and, and that's, that's and, and so may not be content to just say, well, We'll serve the elites in our client states, and we hope there will be some trickle down. It may be that the enlightened realist wants to think really long and hard about uh, about what you you know how you address these problems at a much lower part of the socioeconomic spectrum in a more direct way. You know, Frank Fukuyama had what I thought was a really good uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few months ago about the basically the idea was that. For, for, for the kinds of reasons I've laid out, a kind of global social policy has to be part of America's agenda. And I think you see some of that in the, in, in the Obama speech. But in any event, that is, you know, when I use the term progressive realism, a lot of what I'm talking about is just that realism is fine. You know, the, the, the ostensibly amoral pursuit of national interest is fine, but I do think it involves more and more goals that in an earlier age would have been justified only by reference to morality and now can be, ref can be justified by, by reference to American interest? Well, you know, it's an awkward thing for me because I, I, I did work for, for Nixon uh, and the Nixon Center at one point. I was never a Nixon groupie, just for the record. I, I, uh, not, in the, not in the intense sense that, that my friend Dimitri Symes is, but I was intrigued by the notion at the time of how to pursue American interests, particularly in an era where economic power was um, the new heavyweight issue. Um, realism of the classic sense, I think, is dead. And I think that your framing of progressive realism has been very, very important in the field. We've all been struggling with what to call this, this morphed, alternative strategy for sort of sensible people who care about the world and who are enlightened internationalists, we would hope, and believe in engagement, but yet uh, don't want to be governed by uh, injudicious and by intemperate and, and costly, overly costly uh, responses in foreign affairs. And, and I, I think this is very, very important because, I, you know, we mentioned this uh, Scowcroft and Brzezinski. Scowcroft and Brzezinski, whom I, I know both quite well, are both have both evolved. Scowcroft is one of the great icons of realism, in my view, um, as as perhaps more important than Kissinger in a contemporary sense. You know, he's the guy that went into China first after Tiananmen and others, 
uh, and he did a lot of other, I think, you know, realist uh, 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 things that would make realists happy. But, you know, Brent Scowcroft also gave the Dag Hammarskjöld lecture at CSIS and talked about how indispensable the United Nations had become. Uh, talked about international institutions. Talked about um, the need, in, in, you know, this big Brzezinski was very famous in, in uh, I think it was 1998, in uh, giving a, 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 um, an interview to L'Observatoire, a French publication, and saying that he admitted that Bob Gates, now our Secretary of Defense, who had written a book um, revealing that we had begun to fund the Mujahideen six months before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And this was very controversial because the Soviets always charged us with that. We'd always denied it. And Brzezinski allegedly said that what should he feel guilty about? Uh, funding the Mujahideen and drawing the Soviets into their own Vietnam and ending the Cold War or riling up a bunch of Taliban. I think that Brzezinski has changed dramatically beyond that kind of very shrewd Machiavellian realpolitik into something where we realize, people like me realize, that much of what Samantha Power, Mort Halperin, many people who have been on the classic progressive left on these issues have enormous insights into what to offer. Because what you realize about terrorism today and the why classic realism does not work in, the, in, in, you know, t in many of the facets and why realism in that sense is, is, is ineffective as neoconservatism, frankly, is that at the end of the day, we have to appeal to the same audience that bin Laden is trying to appeal to, trying to make himself look legitimate in their eyes by exploiting grievances. We've been engaged in a killer killing strategy against actors on a stage uh, that bin Laden is an actor on, um, maybe Saddam Hussein, although I would think that was a big mistake on our part, but rather than trying to steal the audience. And you steal the audience and you attract them by inspiring them in different ways, by the character and content of our brand of democracy or what resources can come out of, you know, building a global middle class, though ours seems to be deteriorating in the United States, or by, you know, the idea of liberty, though we seem to have, you know, given up some of that in the debate over the Guantanamo detainees. And, and you know, or by helping to be a good guy and a benign power that tries to promote, you know, great ends in the world or help to, you know, develop other economies. You know, after World War II, John Foster Dulles, not one of my favorite guys in our history, but nonetheless was so worried about Japan slipping back into China's orbit that he embedded Japan deeply in the American economy in a pattern that, that benefited the Japanese economy much more in many ways than it benefited us economically. But politically, it was a shrewd move. If we really cared about the Middle East today and grabbing the attention and changing the currents, we would find ways to embed the Middle East and these young male, what my friend at, uh, who used to work for Jim Wolfenson calls the youth bulge, and put them to work and embed them in, embed their futures in our future. Through now, trade agreements, you mean? not a classic realist statement, but it fits with realism in a progressive way. And I think that's what progressive realism or ethical realism to some degree really means. And there is no canned ism from the past preceding 9-11 that, that answers the problem of how the bad stuff that's being cooked up inside these other societies and either, you know, annihilating or trying to get folks just to look like us or putting up a big wall, all of these are bad strategies. So, you know, I think the winning strategy is going to be, you know, some progressive realism, ethical realism um, hybrid. So is the, is, the, is the deficiency or a main deficiency of, uh, of old-fashioned realism from your perspective that it basically views the nation state as the unit of analysis and doesn't look within the nation state and concern itself with specific constituencies within the nation state? Or what, what is the single major conceptual flaw? Well, the real answer to it, Bob, is that there's no, si no one size fits all anymore. We used to all be about nation states, and, um, you know, it's sort of ironic, to tell you the truth, that the United States was so irritated with nation states in the Middle East during the Cold War because so many of them were affiliated with the Soviets that we and the Brits helped hatch uh, many of the transnational right-wing Islamist movements, including um, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which is broken off into Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Islamic Jihad, and many of the more radical clerics were essentially funded and built by us in the, in, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So we undermine some of the state system ourselves in our competition during the Cold War. That's something a lot of people don't talk about or, you know, aren't held accountable for today. 
Um, I think that we have something that's evolved in places of the world where we call rogue states or failed states or failing states, diminishing states. You know, we see in places like China, um, Japan, the United States, and Europe, rather strong states. The return of statehood, you know, state capability, I think, in Russia. Um, but there are other parts of the world where that's breaking down. And the deployment of classic force against terrorists or against groups of people that we think are bad, we find that these, that these gaps in statehood and, and that the collapse of statehood and the collapse of competencies in governments has yielded a, a, a variant, a mutant kind of government, where Hezbollah can be both a terrorist activity, a terrorist uh, uh, organization, as well as seen as a legitimate representative entity representing much of most of southern Lebanon and millions of people. Same you with can't Hamas. just deploy force. <clears throat> yeah. uh, same as Hamas. Yeah. Uh, and, there are, and there are lots of other, other cases of this. And we're not organized in a way to do that. So in much of the world, what's happened is 9-11 has brought borders back. It's tougher to move ideas and people and money and institutions uh, around the world like we were once doing it. And I, you know, talking, we started out talking about Los Angeles at the beginning of this. You know, I was in Los Angeles when the Rodney King riots um, were going on. And it became very clear to me that, you know, I lived on the west side, as I said, across from Spago and West Hollywood, went to UCLA. You, you, you uh, saw the freeways and how we had organized that city that the wealthy, the powerful, the connected, the enfranchised could drive around, live in the best parts of the city, and skirt around it over these freeways that kind of floated. And you could pretty much avoid East L.A., and you could pretty much avoid a lot of the problems out there. To some degree, that's a good metaphor for what's, ha for what's happened with, with the world. And, and um, you know, we have our highways to jump where we want to, into Dubai or, you know, Paris or you know, Johannesburg, and, and but we can leave big bulks of the world rather untouched and, and on the side, and we can deal with them on Sundays when we're doing our charity work and our, you know, poverty remediation programs. And I think that that, that model is, is coming apart. One, because the parts of the, of the world that where, where statism has, has diminished, and these places are blending into a messy, convulsive, set of problems that, you know, ranges from disease and migration and refugee issues and, and, and on, um, are now threatening the more developed world. We can't, we can't be uninvolved, and this is what brings classic realism to its knees, because you just can't be uninvolved. Right. No, and, I, and, I think, and I think that spirit is certainly in the Obama speech. Okay, let, let's, uh, let's move from one mess to another. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your solution to the Iran nuclear problem? <laughs> Certainly not singing... Uh, you know, kumbaya, kumbaya, not, or 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 singing songs like uh, oh, 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 McCain oh, oh, did Bono, the other day. The, the thing McCain the did. Boys. The the yeah, the, the joke was that he said he was speaking to a group and he said, "What's that old Beach Boys song?" And then he sang, you know, to the tune of Bob Iran, bomb, yeah. bomb, 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 bomb Iran. All right, uh, I cannot solve the issue of Iranian enrichment. I think there are two issues here. I think that anyone watching the Iranian U.S level of tension today on the day that we're making this would find it remarkable that the level of tension today is nowhere near what it was two or three months ago. That things have clicked together. What's clicked together? Well, some of it George Bush got right. Some of it the Russians and Chinese have gotten right. Uh, some of it, uh, I think the supreme leader in Iran, Khamenei, is... Uh, is uh, Smarter than the president of Iran? Yeah, the president... Look, this is my first time on Blogging Heads. I haven't blogged this yet, so I will, I will say something here. I believe that some really interesting things have happened in the last couple of months with Iran that, that we ought to look at optimistically. I don't think, as we once were, that we're on the verge of automatic war with Iran. I think we're still on the verge of accidental war possibilities. I think what happened is the president gave two speeches in January, one responding to the Iraq study group and the other on, you know, State of the Union, in which he telegraphed to the world something that Richard Nixon would never have done. Nixon would have gone out and covertly killed any of the bad guys from Syria and Iran, walked across the borders, done whatever he needed to do, and kept talking the language of diplomacy. Bush instead said, I'm sending 20,000 troops to Baghdad to satisfy Baghdad, and oh, by the way, I'm going to make it worse for the American troops by turning the temperature up on Syria and Iran and telegraphing them that I'm about to start a secret war. It's a highly irrational thing for the president to do, and then he sent the um, carrier strike force groups into Iran, really, really built this up, uh, and at the same time, Iran 
and, and President Ahmadinejad uh, uh, in, essentially embarrassed the Russians. Bad thing to do if you want to divide. I mean, basically what happened, we, America has been in the, in the pattern of dividing our friends and uniting our enemies. Well, Iran began dividing its friends, uh, and that, that redounded to our benefit. And China and Russia both clicked in supporting our U.N. resolutions and efforts and the six-party talks in North Korea, and they came and worked with us collaboratively without the typical bluster and foot-dragging on the second Iran uh, resolution. And what's really interesting, and what I'm going to report uh, probably within hours of this uh, being posted, I'll wait until it's posted, um, is that I've been talking to a lot of European intelligence people about what was really behind the detention of those 15 British sailors in Iran. And I'm now convinced that that, uh, that contrary to, to the neocons that have been out there blaming Khamenei and saying that this was all integrated and Iran had this all planned, that, that this was not, that Ahmadinejad has been uh, handicapped and constrained and whittled down by Khamenei, and Ahmadinejad has been frustrated with that and himself tried an action to jockey for influence inside Iran. And uh, Khamenei and many other parts, uh, Ari La Ali Larajani, the uh, nuclear negotiator, um, was going to resign over this incident. And, and Rafsan Jani, uh, uh, another player, big player in Iranian politics, has seen his star rise now, and Ahmadinejad looks as if he's been completely put in a box today. So you're saying the seizing of those uh, Brits was an initiative of the president of, of Ahmadinejad that did not, not have the, the authorization leader, of the Khamenei. supreme leader, and, and, and then he was slapped down over that, over the issue, ultimately. He was allowed to come out and, and play the role theatrically of announcing the Easter gesture <laughs> uh, of the release of those, those troops. But what's interesting is you see in the tea leaves, and I find it very fascinating, that Ahmadinejad has been trying to get rid of his chief rival, political rival that he sees on the horizon, at the mayor of Tehran. And uh, Ahmadinejad just tried to get him a job as a you know, relatively good job as ambassador to Venezuela, which the mayor has rejected full out, and I think is positioning a political challenge against Ahmadinejad. So now this hasn't been reported in the U.S. press, but it's very important for us to look at these because I spend a lot of time with both State Department and DOD observers of Iran who all see this going on as well, and they themselves are, op are, are, are um, optimistic about how things look for us today. Even Larry Wilkerson, who is, is, is profound and, and, and dug in a critic of the administration right now, as one can imagine, is optimistic looking at these. And while we don't have the enrichment problem solved, and a lot of things could still go wrong, nonetheless, the cycle of cascading, deteriorating events building one on, one on another has stopped on Iran, and we're beginning to see some <coughs> positives building up particularly with the prospect of dumping this crazy president in Iran. Yeah, but it, it does seem to me still that the enrichment problem is just huge. I mean, uh, sure. it, it, first of all, so, you know, I mean, I mean, the Ahmadinejad himself seems determined to see it through. Moreover, I, I don't think he's alone. They'd like to have nuclear weapons. So far, they're getting by with moving in that direction. There's no obvious clean way for us to stop them, that is to say, a peaceful way for us to stop them, at least not one we've discovered yet, and, uh, uh, and, and they, you know, you can well imagine them thinking that ultimately we won't play the military card and that Israel won't play the military card, although, of course, you can, you can also imagine the military card being played, but, I mean, uh, the, you can imagine them, them, them proceeding, uh, and it seems to me there's a lot of momentum behind the program now. And uh, as uh, we recently had uh, Joe Cerencioni and Jackie Shire do a dialogue here, and, and as they noted, if anything, uh, the most recent you know evidence about the technical accomplishments of the nuclear program are uh, more troubling. So it seems to me that fundamentally we still... Uh, am I wrong to still be uh, to still be worried? No, we all need to worry, but I think that that we don't need to be worried that much. I think that we need to create space so that the nuclear energy appetite of the Iranian public, which now is this is a this is a deeply embedded part of the DNA of Iranian national pride, not nuclear weapons, but nuclear energy, and it's our lack of trust in Iran's leadership and what we believe they really want that doesn't solve this. So we have a problem with people wanting nuclear energy and that capacity. 
And we have to find a way to do it. And I think that um, President Hatami and others have telegraphed out that there are lots of ways to achieve this. Small pilot test programs that couldn't produce enough nuclear material over two decades may be, may be a place to rest on. Maybe the kind of international nuclear materials bank that the Russians and, and uh, uh, others have been trying to generate may be an alternative uh, uh, along those lines. Perhaps, you know, the, there, there's another side to it, which is essentially working with the Saudis and, and other uh, energy suppliers in the Middle East to drive the price of oil down. I know that sounds crazy given in these tense circumstances, but there are scenarios in which that's doable because it then handicaps what Iran can, can do to spend money on beginning to open negotiations with Syria. Whether you get anywhere or not, and maybe you balance it so that you don't tick off Israel too much at the beginning, but necessarily giving the image of an alternative course on Syria robs from Iran the impression that Syria is automatically in lockstep with it. All of these things can be done to, to at least uh, somewhat contain the perception of Iranian growth and, and the inevitability of Iranian hegemonic control over the Middle East. And if Iran were to move further down and, and, and issues broke down, you can also then begin doing two other kind of harsh things, which is basically get, it, get the Turks, the Saudis, and the Egyptians to begin talking a lot more about their, uh, their own interest in, in nuclear programs. And, you know, we talk about Israel or America taking military action. While I don't think it will be explicit, overt, warlike action, I could have, would have really imagined the Saudis taking covert action. Uh, there's a lot of of trouble in which a nation like Saudi Arabia can do internally inside Iran that, that we don't look about. So there are many other strategies beyond classic big power collisions that, that, that um, could, could affect Iran's choices. Yeah, but if I understand you correctly, at the core of what optimism you have is the idea that Iran would be totally fine with the peaceful use of nuclear energy alone and not having the nuclear weapons. And no. it seems to me that, that, okay, that's not your driving assumption? No, I think, I, I, I don't trust many of the Iranian elites and the, the Al-Quds force that do want nukes. I think there are a lot of Iranian elites who want nuclear power now, but don't want nukes. Now, we need to figure out in that equation how to not unite everybody and how to figure out some strategy that, that doesn't get the entire Iranian public to deny something that's now become so nationalized because of our mismanagement of this, but at the same time does not yield to uh, uh, a formula or environment that could result in the covert weaponization of that capacity. It's covert weaponization that's the problem. And we either need to do that with inspectors or other confidence-building measures or other technological um, um, takes. It's very hard to get that part of the equation right. But I don't think that we can have a permanently non-nuclear Iran when it comes to peaceful use of nuclear energy. The question is, eventually, what will that world look like, and can you delay that long enough by offering other goodies? But in, I, I don't think that's winnable. No, and so I, I, I would remove that somehow, but I would begin saying, what, what can I do to assure something that, that, that won't yield the covert weaponization of that capacity. No, I, I, and I think in principle we're fine with, with the peaceful use of nuclear energy there and even elsewhere in the region if the, the inspection regime or whatever can be sufficiently uh, intensive that we know for sure that that's all that's going on. Now, in that regard, I have this crazy idea. Tell me what you think of this. I mean, the first thing people always say about this is Israeli politics would never let this happen. Well, okay, fine. Leave that aside. It seems to me this would be in Israel's interest to say, to come out with a dramatic declaration and say, look, yes, we do. We do. It's true. We have nuclear weapons, which, of course, they do have several hundred warheads. Um, and you would, too, if you were us. We are not crazy to perceive that we are surrounded by enemies. But... We would love to see a day when you had a nuclear-free uh, Middle East, in a, day, in a day when the politics and everything really allowed us to feel secure, some day off in the future. You know, very much as, like, the United States back in John Kennedy's time said, when we, when we started the Non-Proliferation Treaty, we said we would love to see a day when we will need no nuclear arms, and we defined that very vaguely, but, but, but it was sufficient to get... Uh, you know, to, to get uh, a lot of impetus behind this program. And I would say, and, and Israel could say, look, as a show of goodwill, 
we will shut down the Demona reactor and let inspectors come in and see that we've shut it down. And two years from now, if, if, if you know, Iran has taken comp uh, accepted comparable uh, inspections and, and, and fine is moving toward peaceful use of nuclear energy and so on, uh, two years from now we would decommission 10 nuclear warheads and so on and lay out some kind of very vague timetable that, 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 you know, that would not strip uh, Ira uh, Israel of nuclear weapons anytime soon, yeah. but would get a ball rolling, uh, you know, and ultimately would be non-committal, but, uh, but, but would provide some momentum. It just seems to me that, first of all, if, if Iran says no, if you don't get anywhere, okay, Israel is in much better position diplomatically in the international community having actually, you know, done that. And then if Iran says yes, uh, then Israel uh, is in much better shape 10 years from now. If, if, you really, if this has really been the way to get into a serious, you know, intrusive inspection regime that ensures that the Middle East broadly does not have a nuclear arms race going on outside of Israel's borders. Now, before you tell me why that wouldn't work in Israeli politics, tell me, tell me, the other, tell me what's wrong with that just in principle as, as, as smart policy. I think that there's a lot right with it. Um, I think that there are some realities in timing that I think someone with the proposal you're making would have to acknowledge. Israel, Israel is complicated. It's much more complicated than people think. Israel certainly does worry about Iran's nuclear capacity and certainly wishes the Iranian people would wake up and realize that their own security is threatened because their desire, their nationalistic desire to have nuclear energy capacity is like Malaysia wanting an automobile facility. It's a matter of national pride and, in their view, climbing the ladder of global power. Um, I think that the Israelis wish the, the Iranians would see that this is a slippery slope into a very, very dangerous and very difficult issue. But, but at the same time, Israeli analysts in the Mossad and in the foreign ministry whom I know are remarkably good analysts of Iranian politics and what's real and what's not. And I would argue that the Israelis, beyond the headlines, underneath all the surface noise, are much more sane and sound on Iran than I think we are, uh, in not really understanding al Ahmadinejad's limits, what Al-Quds can do and can't do, you know, and, and a lot of this. But Israel has no incentive, zero incentive, to disclose its nukes, to allow inspections, and it has every incentive to try and do everything it can, I would argue, short of a military strike, which would ultimately trigger a terrorist superhighway from Iran right up to the edge of its border. So it's ironic that in pursuing its security, it actually does the thing that might actually create a really horrific existential but threat. But that is the incentive to disclose its, its weapons in the fashion that I'm talking about. I mean, if that... If the, alter if the two alternatives to that, and I think they may well be, if the two alternatives to doing what I'm talking about are, A, a military strike with Iran, which, as you acknowledge, could ultimately be bad for Israel's national security, and, B, Iran getting nuclear weapons, it seems to me that the scenario I've laid out is vastly preferable to that. No, and no, that it, is it the is. incentive my, to my do it. My point is they will try to do everything they can to keep Iran from developing that capacity. But the moment Iran has real capacity... All of this rhetoric changes. I think Israel at that point does what you say. They've got to actually become, and, and it's in the vital interest, the survival interests of both states, all of a sudden to get very much, do the things that the United States and Soviet Union did in building stability uh, and, 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 and building the, the, the stabilizing parts of deterrence. Of yeah, but, but meanwhile, meanwhile, first of all, the price, if you're talking about at that point, right. Israel putting nukes on the table, you know, in a diplomatic way, at that point, the price of denuclearizing Iran is much higher for Israel in bargaining terms than it is to do it preemptively now. Secondly, at that you're right point... On, you're right on that. It's just going to be very hard for anyone to do that. Right, but, but secondly, right. also at that point, you've already triggered the regional arms race, and Saudi Arabia's building them, and everybody's... I mean, now is the time to act, yeah. and it re I really think if Israel would think seriously about what seems to be like a radical initiative, they'd realize that probably... Uh, this is this is better than the alternatives on the table. I, you know, it, I think you're right. I think that it is it is politically hard to do. And I thought to myself, well, how? Given the fact that I think it's politically hard to do, and I think Israel, 
I think we'll have what we call strategic readjustment. The moment, you know, if, if Iran did what North Korea did and says, oh, we have nukes, we have eight of them or whatever, and, 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 and we got them when you weren't looking or we got them because John Bolton was a, was a jerk uh, uh, and, and you guys stopped negotiating with us, if Iran did that, I think the whole world changes in, in, in the region and what's been done. I think an arms race gets started, but also you get everybody back in the arms control game of trying to build, you know, the inspection regimes and the deal-making regimes where essentially Iran and Israel hold each other hostage. Uh, and you try to build stability out of that. That would be a crazy thing to do, so why not go your way? Well, it seems to me that the United States has perceived in such a one-sided way on Israel for so long that we're not credible. And I've often thought to myself, how do you change that? Maybe what you do is you remove us. I mean, let's be contrarian for a viewpoint and disagree with most of the staff and colleagues of mine here at New America. Remove us from that and leave the Iran problem to an ascending power. Leave it to China or the newly robust, re-energized Russia. They so don't want this, but they so want us to carry the load. For it. You mean they so don't want a nuclear Iran? They so don't want a nuclear Iran. Really? China, you, th you think China lead. cares a lot? Why really? not just step back and say, guys, you know, we're tired, we have a problem, we're bogged down in the Middle East, we've punctured the mystique of American power, our allies don't count on us as much, our foes are moving their agendas, you've got to carry the load for a while. And you basically say, we're, we'll, we'll be back in a year and we'll see what you've done. And let China do it. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if China were on the front line of engaging Iran, and doing it, the whole game would change. And you're, you've got a much better chance, Bob, of getting the kind of scenario you've talked about, which is so sensible, in play if someone like the Chinese would initiate it and we were in the back seat. Well, How's that, that for a cool idea? For well, well what's the downside of our being associated with it, that it makes Iran more suspicious or something? Not associated, we wouldn't be. China would just. I know, but you're saying the downs. You're saying it's better for us not to be associated with it. Why is it that? Why is that? Because I think they see us as an appeaser and as a as as complicit with Israel's non-declared nuclear capacity. Right. Although, I mean, I still think. Look, if Israel did something this creative, regardless of whether we were still in the game or not. You know, everybody in the region would, would have, like, a sharp intake of breath and give some serious thought to the thing. And the other thing is, I think it would put a lot of pressure on Iran from other countries in the region that really don't want to get into a nuclear arms race to, 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 to respond to the initiative. And, of course, it would also be an opportunity, and, and this is the part that would be hard, I think, for Israel to swallow and a lot of people to swallow, it would be an opportunity for Ahmadinejad to look like a, a big guy, right? I mean, the whole half of the appeal of this to him would be he would be the guy that got Israel to acknowledge that it has nukes and to make this overture. And, and it's always hard to, to, to accept your adversaries, you know, uh, being elevated politically a little by, by an initiative like this. Uh, but sometimes in the long run, you've got to let them have their, their, their day in the sun uh, to do the smart thing. I think in an ideal world, it would be great. I think the reality is Ahmadinejad has burned that bridge. He's burned it because, you know, his, his challenge to Israel, his outrageous comments about wanting to run Israel into the sea and so on, um, were designed, in my view, more to embarrass Mubarak, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, other moderate Sunni regimes in the GCC states, to position himself as the true authority, moral authority, over the Arab Muslims and using Israel as a way to benchmark him as the legitimate voice now that Saddam is gone. To some degree, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia is doing the reverse and stealing from Ahmadinejad the opportunity to do what you said, which is on one hand handing Israel a peace deal, which I think it's stupidly walking away from because I don't think it will be offered again. It's tragic. But I think King Abdullah's uh, efforts there were balanced by Abdullah's critique of America's illegal occupation of Iraq. Why? Because he wants to remind Muslims they care about that, that they're that their, uh, um, the legacy of colonial humiliation uh, in the Middle East is another touch points for many, many Arab Muslims. And so you have 
Israel, the United States, colonialism, all this used as symbols among um, leaders in the Middle East jockeying to influence each other. And I think Ahmadinejad can't flip back into now becoming the deliverer of a deal on Israel. I, I, I just, you know, maybe I'm just short-sighted, but I don't see it. I do see Khamenei, who's also worried about who succeeds him as the Grand Ayatollah and trying to influence that decision, manipulating a lot of this. And, and you know, so, so on one level, I'm, I'm, you know, intellectually intrigued with what you propose. Politically, I think that we've got to do something more to get us off the political tracks we're on because it's very hard to find out, you know, figure out how you get from where we are really going to something that would be a much better proposal. But you ought to write it for the New York Times. Yeah, well... I'm still trying to figure out what my last column will be, but I'm not sure. You only have one more? Yeah. Uh, but that, that, that currently is not a candidate. Um, uh, but maybe sometime. I don't know. I mean, it, the, the trouble with it is you have to answer all these questions that people come up with about why they think it's crazy or won't work politically. And ultimately, you can do a not bad job of doing that. Right. But it's, it's some, some things, that, arguments that are like that are not all that conducive to a 750-word exposition that convinces anybody. No, but I kind of think that some of the thinking you're doing is great. But I also think that the issue of, I think that world is clicking in a better direction despite the Bush administration, in part because China is behaving in ways it wasn't before. And it's become more of a stakeholder. And I think there's something weird happening. And I used to think it was bad, but I'm now reconsidering it. I think there's this void out there that the equilibrium of interests in much of the world has been thrown off. This is realist talk. And this has created the sense of powerful voids. And when you look at our allies, Israel, Japan, the European Union, even Saudi Arabia, they're all behaving differently than they were a couple of years ago because they are taking actions that they would have assumed we would have or they're, they're marshalling their own interests in ways they wouldn't have. And a lot of our enemies or foes or our wannabe foes like uh, Hugo Chavez are behaving in different ways too. So you've got this kind of instability and a lot of shuffling around going on, jockeying around. Saudi Arabia has come out of its shell. Israel certainly has come out of its shell, and you know some folks applaud that, some folks critique it. But I think that there is a, a um, while there's a collision and grabbing for power, there's also more stakeholding. And I think China is doing some of this new stakeholding as well. I think it's remarkable that we got a deal on North Korea and that the second and most recent resolution on Iran clicked together really easily. And I think a couple of reasons are. I think, one... I'm a great fan of Nick Burns, our Under Secretary of State, uh, who, if, if people don't follow, you know, the, the 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 palace politics of the State Department, Condi Rice has attached herself to the Israel-Palestine deal. That's her portfolio. Uh, John Negroponte, the new deputy, has Iraq and Latin America, and Nick Burns has the rest of the world, including Iran, Afghanistan, China, Russia, and he is trading off and synergistically doing deals. It doesn't mean everything is going to be good, and it doesn't mean that Dick Cheney's not out there trying to undermine him at every step, which, which he is. But there are some things that have clicked together that I would have find, found unlikely um, a while back. And one of the key factors is, is China is trying to stabilize things, and that's a help for us. Now, hopefully we won't tick off China too much uh, in no. the process, and we'll keep, keep its priorities where it's going and find some way to you know, routinize this a little well, bit. Well, I'm happy to hear this, Steve, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to try to put this in a way that doesn't sound like I told you so, but I do think I remember you and I having uh, an argument or two a couple years ago where you, in what I would call kind of classic realist fashion <laughs> that more or less assumes the inevitability of conflict among the great powers, being more concerned about China than I was, and I was making the argument that I think if you look at what China does, they rationally pursue their self-interest, and if they will do that in a world in which we actually share many interests with them, th then I'll be fine with that. Am, am no, I imagining yeah, you that? You and I had, I don't say it's an argument. I know that you have a lot of blogging heads fights and going on, and you know we can manufacture one if you want, but I, I think that our point of difference was you were right, but I was saying America had created, no matter if China wanted to be a good player, a bad player, just pursue its own interests, whatever, that America's disengagement from Asia, as Francis Fukuyama and others had written, had created an environment where China could just lay out the charm strategy and, and become and essentially fill the void that we were leaving because of our distraction in the Middle East. 
I also said that if you were Hu Jintao and you had your, you know, Chinese Central Intelligence uh, covert chief talking to you and said, you know, life's pretty good. You know, they used to say that during the Cold War, America fought the Cold War and Japan won, and now they're saying America's fighting the global war on terror and China's winning. Because in this global convulsion that we're seeing, uh, China continues to get, a, you know, more than $50 billion a year in direct investment. And it is doing really, really well in today's environment. You may remember in April 2001, the EP3 incident in which Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and a lot of the neocons were all ready to kind of mechanize their takeover of foreign policy about China, not Saddam Hussein. Right. So, so China has always looked at the fact, it read those PNAC letters uh, from the Project for New American Century, and it knows that there were as many letters about China as there were about Saddam Hussein or issues in the Middle East. So if we ever solved the Middle East and got out of this small country with 24 million people in which we've lavished uh, uh, expenditures of more than $20,000 per head in this, you know, occupation and uh, uh, invasion of Iraq. If that ever ended, if we ever get out of the quagmire, China knows it's next. So I've been basically saying China is led potentially to create instability or, pl or problems or distractions for us because it's so much in our interest. We're doing things in, 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 I think, irresponsibly leaving parts of the global environment so open for manipulation by China that uh, it can't help itself, even if it wanted to behave and do good things. But that's where we were different. But I think it's been a remarkable, all that said, you were right and... Uh, I wasn't not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the main thing. Well, I think we kind of agree that basically there was sufficient convergence of interest among great powers all along that it should have been possible for us to, to, to uh, keep China in line and should have been in our interest to do that very attentively. Yeah. And it really took a pretty screwed up foreign policy for things to get as bad as they started to get. And... And, and you're seeing a kind of return to normalcy. Now, I'm still not sure that I'm, I'm as optimistic as you are, but anyway, I, 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 you, you follow all these things more closely than I am, so I am very heartened by your optimism, which is high, at a higher level than, than it was uh, a year or two ago. I really I hope I'm, 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 I'm on the right track, and, you know, I don't want to oversell this, just to be clear. I'm, I'm optimistic because things have been so crappy that the uptick has been good. Yeah. And, you know... Folks, there are no silver bullets to America's problems in the world today, but we need a few things to click in the right place, and those might yield to others. I tell you, I have some kind of secret information that may or may not be true, but it comes from good source. It doesn't that, matter. Uh, if it's secret, we encourage it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we may have around the corner something that may make Israel crazy, but I think could click out, which is uh, talks with Syria. After next week's talks and next week's foreign minister's meeting in, uh, in Iraq, um, I think not too long after, if nothing gets blown up, if nothing gets done, I think that you're going to see some sort of initiative or some sort of vehicle that draws America into Syria into talks about a different trade. That is remarkable. That is only possible because John Bolton is gone, because Dick Cheney has been put a little bit more on the fringe. Because Bob Joseph, who was at the State Department, resigned. That those kinds of breakthrough, potential breakthroughs, which we're now hearing rumors from, from not only Americans at high levels in government telling me this, but the Syrians telling me this. So you're saying you have inside information suggesting that... Uh, that potentially we are warming up to a, an opening with Syria that our President of the United States and our Secretary of State have repeatedly denied would happen. That is remarkable if it happens. If it's true, you're, so you're saying we might see something within weeks? I would say within a couple of months. Okay. The next week we're going to go through a meeting in which the Iranian foreign minister, the American uh, secretary of state, the Syrian foreign minister, and other neighborhood foreign ministers will all be huddled together. And there will be, whether they're reported or not, some side meetings with both the Iranians and the Syrians by staff. And I believe that the Syrian... Uh, working group will adopt some sort of face-saving vehicle so that no one loses it, and I think it will. And I think Israel will ultimately, um, ultimately, that this will be a way for for Is Omer, even in the weakened state that Omer's in, to do it. Now that I could be wrong, but this is what top people are telling me in the Bush administration, State Department, political appointees of George Bush. 
that is remarkable that they would be confiding those kinds of things because it's so antithetical to some of the things that a more um, pugnacious nationalist, you know, Jesse Helms influenced, you know, Dick Cheney type would never, never yield to. So am I heartened by that? Maybe I'm, you know, grasping for straws and thinking that there's too much good going on when there's been so much crappy. But I'll take a little bit of good like that and, and, and say, okay, now what can we build from there? Okay, well, I am heartened by your optimism. We should sign off soon. I just want to say uh, two things. Um, one is, next time you talk to your various influential friends in, in Israeli government or wherever they are, do share my radical proposal with them, will you? I will. I, I'd, be, I'd be great. Whether you write in the New York Times, you can guest blog it on the Washington Note, and I'll zap it all over because I know they're reading it. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's we actually can do it maybe just that's a place like, to I'll do it. I'll get blogging heads to listen. Okay. The other thing is, quickly, a quick question before we go about... American domestic politics. Are the Democrats being smart with this Iraqi timetable thing? Uh, I mean, I was talking to Mickey Kaus on Blogging Heads, and we finally converged on the idea that one effect of this is they have kind of changed the issue from the, the Iraq, whether the Iraq war is a failure, which it clearly is, and I think will always be remembered as, to the, to the narrower question is kind of, of kind of can the surge succeed enough so that it does seem to make sense six months from now to stay there longer, right? I mean, if six months from now things have turned around just enough so that it, makes, it at least seems to make sense for America to stay there longer, then suddenly the Democrats seem like they've been irresponsible. Whereas if they had kind of stayed out of the micromanaging the war business, they could just sit back, give Bush complete ownership of the war, and say, you screwed up. The war was clearly bad. What do you think about that? I think that... that um George Bush's reluctance to adopt what the Democrats would do assures that he'll still own the war by the time the next election comes around and can be blamed for it. I think the Democrats are performing a service, which I know Mickey and some others don't agree, in the sense that they are telegraphing, whether they succeed in their effort or not, that the American public uh, is divided deeply on this issue and can't be counted on. And that, whether we pass legislation that calls our troops home or not, is not the only issue. The issue is how are the Iraqis themselves looking at this? And I think it's telegraphing to Maliki and other people in government that that other measures are going to be required anyway, because the, no matter who the next president is, the, the, you know the, the latitude and, and you know length, length of time will be there. I don't buy the binary game of staying or leaving in the debate. This is about telegraphing signals um, and trying to do something with those signals. What I'm disappointed in, in the Democratic debate, is that they're not saying what Ch Chuck Hagel is saying, is that behind signaling when we're leaving, whether it's by explicit legislation or by basically having a kabuki of a grand debate with neither side really able to win, you, you, you're, you're saying that behind that we have to have Iraq's warlords, the people who are driving this, look at what's going to happen in, in, inside their country and to themselves, to their families, to their legacy, and do a deal and to come to some deal with its neighbors. And right now, I'm, I am, I'm very mixed about America's ongoing presence there because I think, regrettably, we're preempting that kind of serious negotiation internally. I think you have a real Nixonian element that, of mine that I, I would, will, will bring out, I think, the anger in, in many progressives. I think that we should have started some time ago picking winners on both the Sunni side and the Shia side because power is fragmenting there. We should have been funding, funneling money, arms, fuels, whatever we could do to the people we thought were going to be the co, you know, the, the power people in that, in that country so they could consolidate their own control because they're, you know, power is fragmenting. It's going to be harder and harder to do the kind of deals that Brzezinski and Skokroff, myself and others have called for. And and to some degree, you need to recreate some of these power centers. And so it's not just a function of whether the United States goes or leaves. We're actually becoming less and less relevant to the ultimate solution of this, which is to, to find, you know, the 15 most powerful players in Iraq and get them to do a deal. And that's what this should all be about, not about whether we stay or leave or achieve security. Yeah. It's got to be about coming to a political solution. And I actually think it's slipping away from us. And we may, we may see a decade of, of, of really horrific violence. 
Yeah, well, I think we got a little caught up in the democracy rhetoric. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 for your realist purposes, yeah. you know, one thing that happened is, is Bush, especially after the WMD rationale fell completely apart, he decided, well, then the whole point must have been democracy. And to the extent that you take that seriously, it, it makes you a little a little less uh, kind of pragmatic in the way you're uh, suggesting. But, but Bob, it was false, his, his view of democracy. You know, th there is a very... You know, I had a New York Times piece um, in April of 2003 that, that stopped complaining about the invasion of Iraq and said now the time is, is to get beyond that and talk about how to get an occupation right and how do you actually democratize a place. Mm -hmm. there, there, one measure, one way, there, there were a lot of other ways to do it, but one way is to look at what we did in Japan, which was to break up big aristocratic estates and give uh, you know, as many people as we could a piece of the land action, grow rice, whatever, have, have more control over their lives. And I suggested something like the Alaska Permanent Fund for Iraq. I think it's too late now, but at the time, can you imagine what that might have looked like today where you were able to put resources in people's hands? You might have had something to draw people together than to rather have themselves ethnically and culturally pull themselves apart. They would have kept one kleptocracy from succeeding, you know, succeeding another. There are a lot of really good benefits that might have come from that kind of democratizing reform. And you've, to have a successful occupation, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be Max Boot here who, who thinks like this, but Thank you know, you. To, if you're going to have a successful occupation, and I don't like occupation, but if you are going to eke out a so-called success, you must create a class of political and economic winners that win because you're there. We didn't give any thought to that. We undermined that, and we created lots and lots and lots of losers. We went backwards. And so talking the talk of democracy and doing nothing to basically empower people and give anyone, you know, choice so that they could be more independent from the local tribal chieftain or the mosque was an enormous disaster. And that should have been what we did day one. But we went in trying to privatize assets, you know. Yeah, a little, her a little too much Heritage Foundation maybe. Well, anyway, we, we, we should, uh, we've been having so much fun that cool. we, we, have, we have lost track of the fact that we may have set a new blogging head's record for time consumed. Uh-oh. No, there's no, there's no, time is infinite on the web. There's no, uh, no intrinsic problem there, but... Uh, well, it's been a pleasure, Bob. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't yell more. I know you were looking for a more combat. I was hoping you'd threaten to hang up, but maybe next time, Steve. Okay, sir. All right, take Thank care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.